Hello, I'm Dr. Sean Davis and I'm Director of the Electron Microscopy Facility in the School of Chemistry at the University of Bristol. We've got a range of electron microscopes and atomic force microscopes within the facility that support research throughout the department. By association, they're available for undergraduate research projects. Here I'm going to introduce a transmission electron microscope and show you some of the information that we can get from a material when we analyse it with this instrument. There are two types of electron microscope, transmission electron microscopes and scanning electron microscopes. The scanning electron microscopes have got the simplest operation. The transmission electron microscopes have got the simplest design. It's very similar to an optical microscope. We have a source of illumination at the top, in this case a way of generating an electron beam. The electron beam is then fired down through the column of the microscope and on this microscope the sample actually goes in here. It's a transmission electron microscope so we're trying to transmit that energy through the sample and it's mainly used to look at the internal structure of materials. The electron beam passes through, interacts with the sample and that allows an image to be generated or projected onto a screen or onto a display. The generation of the image relies on contrast and the contrast arises from differences in atomic weight, differences in thickness and differences in crystal orientation. The electron beam is still interacting with the sample. We're predominantly interested with the electrons that are transmitted through the sample to generate an image, but X-rays are still being scattered from the surface of the sample and there are still secondary electrons being generated. So we can collect the X-rays and use them to get a chemical signature of the material in the same way as we can on a scanning electron microscope. So we've got a similar detector attached to the column of this transmission electron microscope which allows us to analyse materials, get the element composition, but also map the distribution. The key difference is, is unlike on the scanning electron microscope, where the resolution is limited to the order of tens of nanometers for this type of analysis, on this transmission electron microscope, we can actually use a beam size or a probe size of the order of sub-nanometers. So we've got a very small electron beam as a probe to analyse the sample. So in this case, we're looking at, we can look at materials that are nanoparticles, particles that are of the order of 10 times 10 to the minus 9 meter in diameter, and actually plot the distribution of the elements at that very small length scale. So in this example here, we've got some samples that have been produced by one of the research groups on the crystalline nanomaterial and we can see the distribution of copper, iron, oxygen, neodymium, cobalt and chromium within those particles. So the spectrum showing the different elements present within the material, the relative, the relative atomic weight percent of the material. This is the transmission electron micrograph image and then you can see the distribution of individual elements mapped across the sample. So copper, iron, oxygen, neodymium, cobalt, chromium. The images produced by the transmission electron microscope show us the internal structure of materials. For crystalline inorganic materials we're interested in the crystallography, the arrangements of atoms and the composition. We can use the X-ray analysis to tell us that chemical composition and we can also do diffraction and high resolution imaging to actually see the crystallographic arrangement of ions within a lattice. This sample is a sample of a superconductor being produced by one of the research groups within the department who are interested in controlling the morphology of the particles and trying to produce long anisotropic or not cubic particles 
of superconductor. When we zoom in on this material, we can actually start seeing the arrangement of the individual ions and atoms within the lattice structure of the material. So the scale bar in this image is 20 nanometers, or 20 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. As we zoom in to these materials, we can see the arrangement of the constituent ions within the material. We can see the separation between these two bright spots, which correspond to some of the heavier ions within the material, is of the order of 0.37 nanometers. So effectively, we are seeing the lattice planes directly within the crystal and measuring the separation between those crystalline planes. As the electron beam generates the image, it also produces a diffraction pattern. And the diffraction pattern is just produced at a different plane to the image within the instrument. So we can record the diffraction pattern and the image simultaneously from this diffraction pattern. We can also get information on the structure and crystal form of the material from this diffraction information. For inorganic materials like gold, which are very high atomic weight, we get very good contrast in the transmission electron microscope because effectively the electron beam is being scattered by the constituent atoms. So the thicker a material is, or the constituent atoms are higher atomic weight, the more they're going to scatter the electrons. Those particular regions will appear darker in the image. When we've got soft or largely carbon-based materials, they are inherently low contrast. Because they're low contrast, we have to use indirect methods to actually be able to see the structures. This image is actually showing a protein fiber, and it's been prepared by what's called negative staining. So what that means is we make a solution of a very high atomic weight crystal. We then deposit that onto the sample, and it produces a negative image. So we see darker contrast where we've got this higher contrast salt solution evaporated off. In this case, it's actually a uranium salt, so very high atomic weight. And the actual protein structure is the brighter part in this image. The darker parts are just the heavy or high atomic weight salt solution filling in the gaps around the structure to enable you to see these fibrils of protein. For crystalline materials or high atomic weight materials, we have inherently high contrast because they scatter the electron beam sufficiently that they appear dark in the projected image, so we get contrast. Specimens for transmission electron microscopy typically have to be very thin. The support films are amorphous carbon films, so to generate any contrast we need materials that are generally higher atomic weight. For biological material it's typically low contrast. To be able to image it effectively we often have to use indirect methods like negative staining. Within the School of Chemistry we have research groups looking at projects involving proteins, cells, as well as synthetic polymers and synthetic gels or synthetic analogues of biological materials. To be able to image the structures and features effectively, we use these indirect methods, which often include just using salt solutions of high atomic weight materials, often heavy metal salt solutions that contain platinum or uranium, and these are just placed on the sample film evaporated so we actually get a negative image. The dark areas are the salt solution whilst the brighter features are actually the feature of interest. In this sample we've actually got a biological cell which you can see in the middle of the screen now as I increase the magnification. This is actually an immobilized and what we call fixed, so chemically made inert so it's no longer dangerous in any way fixed cell of gonorrhea. This is part of a research project that I'm involved in within the Department of Chemistry and a postgraduate student is working with me in chemistry and someone in medicine at ways we can target therapeutics or create diagnostics for gonorrhea in particular in resource poor settings. So we can zoom in on the cell structure so we can get useful information on the size and the shape of cellular structures 
and moreover we can start seeing more clearly on this higher resolution instrument the protein fibers or protein structures in the background clearly showing these filaments as white in negative contrast with the darker contrast coming from the heavy metal indirect stain solution. This instrument is the most expensive one we've got in the facility. This is of the order of half a million pounds for the basic column, but with all the detectors and all the other bells and whistles on it, you're talking three quarters of a million to a million pounds. But it's, it's a mid-range, so there are national facilities where there's even bigger instruments. So. The difference, obviously, between the transmission electron microscope and the scanning electron microscope is this idea that, like a light microscope, we're transmitting the image through to be able to see the internal structure. So the column is obviously a lot bigger. We're also accelerating the electrons at a higher velocity because the faster we accelerate them, the shorter their wavelength is. The shorter the wavelength is, the better the resolution. So with those faster fired electrons, shorter wavelength, we get this atomic level resolution. But the latest generation of microscopes literally allow you to have an electron probe that is nanometer, sub-nanometer, and be able to do the chemical analysis literally at the atomic scale. So the types of models you might be familiar with in terms of crystals with different colored spheres all packed together, we are literally with the transmission electron microscopes now able to use an electron probe to individually address atoms, determine their chemical composition and to build up that crystal structure model. This instrument in itself would typically not be available to undergrad students. Unlike the scanning electron microscopes, the time to train someone on all the aspects of this instrument, all the different analytical tools that are available on this instrument, isn't appropriate within the short time scale of the, two, the typical two terms time scale of an undergraduate project. But what we have is a smaller version of this machine which students are typically trained on. So this is our highest end instrument, analytical instrument. So undergraduate projects do use it. They submit samples they produce and we can do the crystallography, the chemical composition and the imaging so to be able to directly get information on the crystal size of the material. But for other projects, often people are just interested in the actual size of particles that they've been producing. These are typically the projects where undergraduate students would actually get training on the transmission electron microscope so that they can actually grab images and be able to get particle size analysis from their materials. So the extra resolution we get from the TEM on the, on the scanning electron microscope we're typically looking at magnifications up to 50,000 times of the order of a few to tens of nanometers in terms of resolution. On the transmission electron microscope, we're looking at a resolution of the order of 0.2 nanometers. To train a postgraduate student on this particular instrument, we're probably talking using it half a day a week for a term to get familiar with all the different aspects of the instrument. On the scanning electron microscope, the filament is optimally aligned. There are no other adjustments needed. The difference with this instrument is that as well as loading the sample in and the, being careful in terms of not causing mechanical damage loading the sample, every aspect of this instrument has to be aligned because we're look, using such a fine electron beam probe it's very sensitive. All these extra dials are to make sure the beam is circular in profile, is aligned perfectly with the electron optical axis of the instrument. There's lots more minor adjustments. It looks very much like 
in terms of the number of actual buttons and dials, like an aircraft cockpit. A number of these we don't actually use routinely, but it allows a lot of flexibility for individual experiments to really be able to optimise at a very high end the level of analysis we need. So there's not really a default option for these for this particular instrument. The other transmission electron microscope we've got, it runs at a slightly lower accelerating voltage, it's a more robust instrument and it keeps its electron optical alignment and focus a bit more consistently so we use we can train people up relatively quickly on that instrument so that they can use it just for literally digitally recording or image grabbing from their samples without having to fine tune the alignment to be able to get meaningful and quantitative data this instrument is not switched off so it is continually running. The nature of the filament in this machine is very different to on the scanning electron microscope we saw earlier with the tungsten filament. It's got what is called a field emission gun. Because of the extra alignment that's needed and the conditioning that's needed of that gun, it's literally left on all the time. So it's continually operating and all we do is close the gun valve. So there's a continual beam of electrons and we just have a valve that closes off that gun chamber to allow us to load the sample up. So a research chemist would typically be running samples on this machine, minimum would be half a day. To get a full set of data, structural and chemical compositional data, we are typically looking at the order of two to three days per sample in terms of getting images, crystallographic data, actually get meaningful data that you can interpret and get in x-ray analysis or chemical composition data. It is so cool because to be able to maintain optimum imaging conditions, the environment has to be kept at a steady temperature and the water that actually cools the lenses within the instrument has to be kept at a a steady temperature. So we've got a chilled water supply at about 18 degrees feeding the instrument and cooling it down and the air, the ambient air temperature has also got to be about the same order of magnitude to make sure we don't get any condensation within the lenses within the microscope.